Good evening. Let's all stand together as we begin. Number seven in your hymn books. Number seven. Sing it out. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. on that second his name above all names shall stand exalted more and more at God the Father's own right hand where angel hosts adore blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name got some warm weather here today. I think the, yeah, it never snows in June, so you don't have to worry about it. And uh, so we don't have to worry about that. Pray for uh, Mrs. Wood. Uh, she is in the Philippines for a while, and so she went there to see the family, and then she'll be coming back in a few weeks. And then Jody Ward is still in the hospital with infection on her leg. And it doesn't help that she has diabetes, so she's not healing too well. So pray for Jody. Mrs. King has surgery coming up six more days and counting. You know, she's been waiting a long time. And then Ernestine to heal so that she can come back to church. She says she's coming on Sunday. We'll see. And uh, but she says she's coming, so we'll see if she gets here or not. All right, let's bow our heads together. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and thank you for that uh, we can come to you and bring our requests to you, bring uh, needs to you. And we got four ladies here and, and uh, need prayer, and we need you to touch their bodies and heal them, protect them. I uh, pray you be with Mrs. Wood while she's in the Philippines and bring her back safely. And then uh, Jody's been in the hospital for a long time, so I pray you'll bring her home. And then Mrs. King, her surgery coming up, help her as she's still dealing with the pain and just having to live with it. And, and I just pray that you'll help her. But Lord, you know the needs that are represented in this room tonight. I pray you'll bless. I pray you'll be lifted up in the service. May you be honored by everything done. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Number 117. Keep up that good singing. 117. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith.
right, if you're a guest here tonight, please remain seated for a moment to let me have our members stand together at this time. Our ushers, they have a pamphlet we'd like to give to you once you receive it, uh, then stand with us. And we want to welcome each other here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And let's all stand together. Let's welcome each other. <clears throat> Brother Chris. Announcements, please, if you'll find your seats. And if you are a guest here tonight, inside that pamphlet is a visitor's card. If you'll take a moment and fill that out and then give it to me or one of the ushers after the service, please. Tonight is the Truel's 10th anniversary. Is it 10th? 10th anniversary. They're in church on their anniversary. And so that says a lot about them. And so thank you for being in church tonight. But don't forget, you got to do something on another night, you know. Yeah, yeah, he says that, you know. You know, we, never mind, I won't say anything. Uh, don't, for, don't forget on June the 3rd, coming up this Friday, is the high school graduation. We'll be here in the auditorium, 7 o'clock. And if you can come, be here for that. And then the following Tuesday, June 7th, is kindergarten graduation. And then Senior Saints are having a get-together at the Golden Corral on June the 7th at 11.30 a.m., so you can sign up. There's a sign-up sheet in the back of the auditorium for that. Promotion Sunday for our children going to the next grade in Sunday school is going to be on June the 12th. And so that's a week from Sunday. And uh, then, uh, let's see here, we can skip some of these. And uh, let's see here. We got to one, two, three, four, five seniors that I know of in our church that are graduating. We ha have uh, David Cridle and then, let's see, Mr. Hymas, uh, Lisa Sears, Theodore, and uh, Nick is there anybody else we know of that's graduating? And, uh, well, if we hear of anybody else, let me know about that. You know, we've had, in April and in May, we've had some, we had seven baptisms in April and eight baptisms in May. And, uh, you know, that's a result of people, one, uh, bus ministry going out. But these were not all bus ministry kids. These were uh, adults as well that got baptized. And so uh, I want to say thank you for keeping the focus on the main thing. And, uh, the, the, you know, most people are only concerned about salvation. They say, well, I got salvation. I got the best part out of the way. And that may be the best part. You miss the, miss the hell part. But still, that's not fulfilling the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is also completing the circle. You got baptism, church membership, and discipleship. And uh, we had... Uh, a couple finished the discipleship program as well. And then Father's Day is coming up, so we're g I'm gathering up the gifts. I got some good gifts for you this time. And, uh, well, not like this is the only time, but uh, uh, we're, we're going to have them like we did the ladies. We'll have them back there. So every service you come into, you drop, we'll have some cards back there. You drop your name in the basket. And I'm going to do something different. I didn't think of it with the ladies, but if you bring a guest, drop your name in another time every time uh, you bring that guest back. And so if you can uh, do that, if you can get, find someone, bring them to church, you don't have to tell them, hey, you're going to help me get something, but you can uh, go ahead and do that and just write your name again, drop it in there for bringing a guest. And so we're going to add that little bit thing to it there. So if you can do that, that would help. Father's Day coming up in three weeks. You know, all the, uh, 
all the infractions, all the uh, things we've done wrong are all erased on Father's Day. We start new slates, everything we start over, and uh, then we'll, we'll probably get in trouble that evening before it's over with, but you know, still, uh, it's a good time. I would try to, if, if your dad lives in the area, invite him to come, and uh, we'll honor all fathers here on that day. All right, let's have another song. Number 112 before the offering tonight, 112. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow Everywhere He leads me I would follow, follow on Walking in His footsteps till the crown be won Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus pray. Thank you, Lord, for songs that stir us and stir our hearts to follow you. Lord, I pray that would be our goal in life is to keep our eyes fixed on you. And Lord, make you proud of what we're doing. Lord, I pray that you bless this offering and the preaching to come in your name. Amen. Good job, Bren. And take your Bibles open to Exodus 14. Exodus 14. And let's all stand together as we read. Exodus 14 is where we're going to go. Read, read two verses there. Then we're going to go to Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. So Exodus 14 and then Romans 8.29. Alright. Exodus 14 and we're going to read verses 10 and 11. 
uh, two verses there. And so join me on the 11th verse. And the Bible says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou thus dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Sorry about that. I got the words backwards. And now Romans uh, 8 and verse number 29. And we'll read, uh, let's see, verse 29 together. Ready? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, a lot of people get hung up on that word predestinate. It means that God forethought. And notice what he forethought that. It's not forethinking that who's going to go to heaven and who's going to, he going to hell. God knows that because he's all-knowing, but he, the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish as well. So he died for everybody, and it's left up to us. But his foreknowledge here, or his predestination here, is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. That doesn't mean you're going to look like him. It means you're going to act like him. You're going to be holy. You're going to live a godly life like him is what he's referring to there. And so tonight I wanna, we're going to look at what is godly living? What is godly living? Father, tonight as we look at this, I pray that you'll help each one of us to look into our own hearts and be honest with ourselves, are we really living a godly life? And then, Lord, may we, uh, may we uh, uh, find a little bit something that we can do to, to apply it to our life, to become more like Christ. You predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. I don't think that means we're going to look like him physically, but it means we're going to be what the word Christian stands for, a little Christ. And so tonight, would you bless us as we study? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. sends me to my knees. 
Though my tears flow like a river, yet in him there's sweet relief. There's no need to get discouraged, there's no need to talk defeat. God will make this trial a blessing, and the whole wide world will see. God will make this trial a blessing, just be patient you. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. And uh, if you'll keep your, well, if you look at your Bibles in Exodus again, want to look at that just real quickly. Uh, I just was reading this today and came across this uh, uh, two statements. One is made in verse 10 and the other one's made in verse number uh, 11. And the one I want you to see is where it says they were so afraid. And then the phrase goes, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. That sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? You know, they're, you know, they're, 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 they got a need. They got a, you know, I mean, they're trapped on each side by the wilderness. They got the Red Sea in front of them. Here comes the Egyptian army behind them. And then all of a sudden it says they cried out unto the Lord. And then it says in verse number 11, toward the end of it, right after the word Egypt there, it says, Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? So, there's one word that comes to mind here when you read those, those two statements there. One, they're crying out to the Lord. And then the other one, they're looking at Moses and they're, they're saying, what'd you do, just bring us out here so we could die here? And so it's the word unbelievable. It's amazing how we can go from like a pendulum. On one way, we can be so spiritual. And on the other way, it can be so worldly. And so the question here is, which is it? Were they spiritually minded that they just just cried out to the Lord and as a group they were spiritually minded, crying out to God for help? Or were they carnal minded and worldly and uh, blaming Moses for their problems? So which was it? So it's almost like in one breath they're saying, oh God, please help us. And in the next breath they look at Moses and say, it's all your fault. You, you, ha- you couldn't just leave well enough alone. You had to bring us out here in the wilderness so we could, there wasn't enough graves in Egypt so we could die out here. So if they were willing to turn to God for his help and use prayer as a means of securing God's help, then they should have kept on going with it. But they didn't. They then went and turned and, and uh, you know, an emergency to us is not an emergency to God. And God doesn't work on our timetable. But if they were going to uh, use God and be spiritually minded, they should have kept on praying and let God answer when he was because we know the rest of the story. He, he uh, parted the waters. They crossed over on dry ground. Then he drowned the Egyptian army. But instead, they threw up a prayer to see what would happen. And when nothing happened, then they resorted to the fleshly action of criticism and criticizing Moses and attacking Moses. So when it comes to the Christian life, living the Christian life isn't just something that happens because you're saved. We all say in any any soul winning church that sees people saved, you know that just because someone gets saved doesn't mean they are automatically going to live the Christian life. Now some do and thank God for those, but some do not. I was a person when I got saved, and, and uh, I, I just, uh, it just clicked. I got into church that, uh, that was a Sunday, that Wednesday. No, nah, I think I missed that first Wednesday. I, I probably didn't know about church on Wednesday. Uh, and, and so I went on Sunday morning, and uh, then, but from that time on, it was Sunday morning because the preacher said, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He graduated from uh, Highland Park when Lee Robertson was there. And so Lee Robertson always said, it takes three to thrive, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And, and so uh, Brother Jack did the same thing, you know. And so uh, I did that. But we see a lot of people that get saved. Now, we don't, we're not the judge. We don't know if they get saved or not. We're, uh, you know, we, we do our best, make sure they understand. No to the sinners. There's a penalty for sin because if you don't know you're a sinner and there's a penalty, why do you need to be saved? And uh, they get saved, and, and uh, then uh, uh, but they, they, many of them do not just automatically start walking and becoming like a Christian and walking uh, with the Lord. So the Christian life is not just something that happens just because you're saved, if I could use this word, it's almost a learned behavior. That almost sounds too worldly. That, you know, I can just 
do it. But it's, it has to be learned to a degree. I, I hope you'll give me some leeway there. But uh, it's developed by consistent godly living. And over, a, over, time, it, uh, 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 over time, it produces godly habits. You know, it's like anything else. You've got to start doing it. And as you start doing it, it becomes a habit. And uh, things in our Christian life have to become habits. Going to church needs to become a habit, and, and uh, uh, witnessing needs to become a habit. If you start doing those things, it will, it will become a part of you, and then you'll see that you're starting to do godly living. So what is godly living? So number one, it is not an emotion that comes and goes. You know, sometimes, and here's where independent Baptists are, are guilty. We're like that pendulum. We'll swing, and we're in a good mood. Oh, we're, we're living godly. You know, we're acting right, we're doing right, but then when, when something bad happens, that pendulum swings over here and the flesh rears its ugly head up. And, and we have no problem letting people know how we feel and we have no problem uh, getting in the flesh, so to speak. But you know, that's not necessarily godly living. It's not an emotion to where you're godly when you're feeling godly and, and, and when you're not, and, and that's not what it is. It's, it's doing what is right consistently every day and it's even doing right when the pressure's on because when the pressure's on that's really going to bring out what's inside because well, I didn't mean to say that oh yeah it was down inside it, it came out so you, we, we need to uh, work on that but which is it for you is it is it where well, you're throwing up prayers to see what will happen or is it really, uh, 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 when and it doesn't work, complaining about what bothers you? So godliness is not an emotion that comes and goes. In verse 10, they said they cried out unto the Lord. Verse 11, hast thou taken us to die in the wilderness? So the Hebrews were heard crying for God's help, but almost in the next breath, they're complaining to Moses about what's going on. So godliness is not just something that happens because you're saved, it's a behavior that's almost learned. It's developed by consistent godly living and doing what's right. And over time, it produces a habit. So it's surrendering to the Lord. You have to do that. Surrender to Him and cooperating with what He's trying to do in your life because God is trying to do something. The Bible says that He's predestinated us to be conformed to the image of His Son. He's been changing people since Adam. He knows exactly how to do it. He knows exactly what's to take place. And he knows how to get things working in our lives. But here's the thing. It's not just the outward things that need to change. It's also some inward things that needs to change. So it's a behavior. He's trying to change you. And, but, but as he's trying to change you, you have a part in it too. You have to cooperate. You have a part. And it's like anything else that you're unfamiliar with. Uh, in the beginning, you got to learn what to do. And as you learn it, then it becomes a part of you. And uh, then it, 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 uh, it, you, you develop the godly living. I read something this week that was shocking to me. Charles Smith, who's the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. <laughs> okay? He said, we're having a problem. We're having a decline in atheism. Well, if you say amen about it, you don't understand what he's saying. Why about it, though? So listen to what he says. He's complaining that there's a, uh, there's, there's a, a decline in atheism because there's a lack of opposition. He said the opposition is what gives us our drive to fight it. And here's the reason for the opposition. He says, we don't have the old repressive, and that's his words, the old repressive religion that stimulates atheism anymore. He said, instead, that, he said, they're not preaching hellfire anymore, and they're not preaching Jonah in the whale anymore. They're going for this cheer them up religion. And uh, that's not the old time religion that the preachers used to preach a long time ago. And it's this new sort that's not really so bad it, because it doesn't interfere with their lives. And so he's complaining that they're having a decline in atheism. He says they, they, they go for this cheer them up religion and they spend more time, uh, or he said they spent more time in the old days pleasing God. Now they try to please their fellow men 
and themselves. That says a lot about our world today, doesn't it? This, 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 I don't know if you noticed it Sunday morning. I didn't notice it, but there was a, a lady that came in, and, and as soon as the song started singing, she got up and left. And one of the men followed her and said, is there a problem? Can I help you or something? She goes, this is not my kind of church. I, I want more of the swinging kind, you know. The, the, she wanted more of the contemporary kind. You see, the music isn't to entertain you. The music's to stir your heart. To prepare you. That's what the music's for. You can go to a concert and get entertained. You can turn on a stereo and get entertained. That's not what, that, that's not what, ch church ought to be different than going to Walmart or going to a baseball game or something like that. But, but I thought it was, it was almost hilarious that th this guy named Charles Smith, who's the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism, he's complaining that we don't have some hellfire and damnation preachers out there anymore. And it's hurting his numbers in his Organization. I started to say church, but it's in his organization. He said the people are wanting more and more. They're wanting this, this cheer them up religion and uh, uh, where they're, they're, they're not trying to please God as much. They're trying to please themselves and their fellow man. But anyway, godliness is not emotion that comes and goes. Number two, godliness is not acting religious. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, if you will, and uh, we'll look there. And, of course, that's a very familiar verse where Jesus is calling the, uh, the uh, uh, Pharisees their hypocrites. You know, uh, uh, that would be like a preacher today getting up and naming names and some people getting upset about it. I don't think you ought to be naming names. I had a lady one time because I jumped on the Mormons one time. She got up and left. She, did, she, she got some friends in the Mormon church and, and she said there's nothing wrong with it. Well, she just doesn't understand the religion. I, and I told her, I said, ma'am, if this house across the street had a gas leak in it, and it had uh, gas, you know, uh, inside the home. And if you go inside there, you're going to die. And you saw someone out there with a sign that says, come on in and play for the kids and the children in the church. Would you say something? She said, yes, I would. Well, that's basically what I'm doing then, uh, about the Mormon church. But in any case, uh, uh, the, the, the godliness is not acting religious. In Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 6 and verse 2, the Bible says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, he's talking about giving, do not sound a trumpet before thee. Notice it says, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Now that's the scribes and the Pharisees. And in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou give, doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what the right hand uh, doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray as standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So God is saying, I don't want you to be like the hypocrites are. Now, I can imagine he could, he could say the hypocrites and everybody automatically knew what they meant, the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. But this is probably one of the first times he said it. And you know something? If he didn't call them hypocrites here, we probably wouldn't label them hypocrites. We would think, well, that's the way religion is. That's the way things are. But he called them hypocrites, so we know the truth now. But he says, when you go in that, when you're praying, he said, I don't want you sounding a trumpet and, and making a big show that, so that people can see you. He said, they have their own reward. He said, kind of do it private. And that doesn't mean you can't have a public prayer like we did here today, but we're not doing it for show. That's what he's saying. And when you give your alms, they're like, they're like is everybody watching here now uh, as I give this? They, they, want, they want everybody to see what they're doing. He called him a hypocrite. And the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word uh, corona mei, something like that. And it means to act as an actor. So in other words, like an actor, they're not, they're, they portray another individual. They're not really, that's not them. That's not how they act. That's not how they talk or whatnot. They're, they're assuming the role of a character in a play or, a, or in a movie or something. And it's, it, what he's saying here, it's a form of insincerity. Those, those uh, Pharisees, when they're praying, they're not sincere. Jesus even said when he talked about the publican that went down to his house justified, he said, that guy's play, praying with himself. He was praying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this guy here. You know, I, I, I give my alms, I, I, I fast, I do all the, he's naming all the things that he does. And so it's not acting religious because anybody can act religious. We all act religious every time we come to church. But the difference is some are sincere, uh, some are acting. They don't want to uh, the reveal how they really are on the outside. Uh, how they are on the inside. So it's not acting religious because anyone can do that. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is we've forgotten 
that we're no longer slaves. We're no longer slaves to sin. We've forgotten that he promises us certain promises that we can claim. And we've forgotten that there's a deeper relationship with Christ that is the key to everything that we do. It's not more seminars. I'm not against going to preaching conferences and I'm not against having seminars and things. We have one here. But, but it's, that's not the answer. Seminars are not the answer. It's not trying harder. It's not seeking some mystery or hidden principle that's in the Bible. No, it's, it's a deeper relationship with Christ. And when you get that deeper relationship with Christ, that does something inside you that makes you want more of it. And when you get that desire inside you, knowing him more deeply, it opens a floodgate for greater peace and greater love and and it enables access that we can live the Christian life and be sincere about it. There's a difference between uh, ice cream and gelato. Do you know the difference? Gelato is ice cream on steroids. If you, have you ever been, who's, anybody here ever been to Italy? Italy has gelato, man. They, you, you'll kill yourself eating that. When we went there on a missions trip, Brother Bus took us up. We, we drove for 30 minutes up the up top of this mountain. He says, I know we're going a long ways, but it, trust me, it's worth it. I had never had gelato in my life. And we got up there, and he was a little, just one old man in there. He had a shop all to himself, and apparently Brother Bus had found it. And, and he scooped out this gelato to us, and, and we tasted that, and I went, Wow. Ate that all up, got me more, you know. I mean, I just, I just loved gelato. When I'd go preach for a brother, in the little town that Brother Northrop was in, that little town had a giant gelato shop in there. And, that, and every day we would go there and pull over and get gelato. I said, well, I just love that stuff. Go down to Safeway, they got gelato. That stuff's nasty. <laughs> it's not the real thing. It's an imitation. And, and, and so once you taste that gelato, you just want more. I mean, it, I mean it, it's really... Now, you can go to some places in the United States. They, they can make it that one place in, in uh, Maine where Brother Northrop was. They made it good. And there's other places, but I have not found one around here in Tacoma. Around here, I haven't found one. The big city of Tacoma doesn't have a gelato place, but the little tiny town in Maine does. And so it just, I don't understand that. But it's, it's, one is the real deal. One is an imitation. And that's the way it is with acting religious. Some act religious and it's the real deal. Some act religious and they're only imitating. It's not an imitation. That's not all. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 now, back where the T's are in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And um, 1 2 Thessalonians, 1 2 Timothy. So 1 Timothy chapter 6. And uh, look at verse number 5, if you will, please. Uh, uh, Verse 5 says, Perverse disputings of men. Let me see. Verse 5. Perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Notice these words. Supposing that great gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. He's saying there's some people in the area at that time that they thought that the more you accumulated, the more gain you had was godliness. And and, and the Bible's telling us that that kind of person you need to withdraw from because he didn't want them thinking that just because you gain a lot of things that God has blessed you maybe that that, uh, you're godly because of it. That's actually the charismatic view. The charismatic view is God blesses you. They teach that they want you to be rich at financial success and whatnot. But that's that's a charismatic view. But the main proof is not wealth. And, and in, their, in, the, in the charismatic view, the proof that you're godly is the wealth that you have. And that's not what the Bible's saying. Uh, let me ask you this. So, suppose someone wins the lottery. Are they godly? No, that just means they were lucky. They got lucky in gambling. That's all it was. Or suppose that uh, uh, you, 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 uh, someone wins $100,000 in a bingo game. Are they godly? That doesn't prove godliness, so great gain doesn't mean godliness. That just means they, were, they just got lucky. They were playing the game, and they got lucky. And so great gain or gain is not godliness. The best way to prove godliness is godlikeness. Godlikeness. And when you talk about godlikeness, it's not just on the outside. 
Because we can fool people that way. It's on the inside. Nobody can see that, but you know that. You and God knows that. Proverbs 12, 5 says, The thoughts of the righteous are right. So what he's saying is even the thoughts of that kind of person are going to be right. They're not going to be thinking the wrong kind of thoughts. So it's an inward cleansing. It's an inward trying to do right. So a person that is wanting to be godly will have a desire for personal holiness. It's on the inside. He's wanting that. It's a godly person will not only win the battles on the outside, say they get saved and maybe they got a smoking problem, they'll, they'll eventually beat that. And, and it, people say, well, I can't do it. I, I understand it grabs you. But you don't understand the power of God that you have when your Holy Spirit comes in as well. It can give you victory over that as well. But it's, it's the inward areas as well as the outward areas. It's not just on the outside. It's also on the inside. Now turn to John 14. Let me show you something there. In John 14. I'm sorry, I think that may be, may be the last verse or a uh, place to turn or one more. Uh, John 14 in your Bibles. And look at verse number 10. John 14 and verse number 10. All right, the Bible says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now notice, notice the last phrase here. The Father that dwelleth in me, he, the Father, doeth the works. Some, whatever he's doing. And so God did not create us to just imitate Christ. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Until you get the handle of it, <laughs> be like Christ and imitate him. But the problem is lost people can imitate Christ as well. They can, they can walk like him. But most people think that godliness is the ability to imitate God. And that's not what godliness is. It's the measure of conformity that uh, produces the godliness. That's not what it is. So let me ask you this. Which of these activities was more spiritual when Jesus did them? Was it the Sermon on the Mount? Was it the raising of Lazarus? Or was it the washing of the disciples' feet? Which one of them was the more spiritual of the thing? It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They all were spiritual. Because notice now, verse 10 again, the last phrase, verse 10. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So it was the Father washing the feet. It was the Father raising uh, raising Lazarus. It was the father preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He just used Jesus. So G now I know there's one God. There's, you know, the, you've got a, the Trinity there and so forth. But none of them was any more spiritual than the other. So what he's saying here is the whole activity that Jesus did on the earth as a man was the father's work in the son through the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. So in other words, godliness then is allowing, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. But it's allowing him to work through you. And when you do that, that's when your activity, everything becomes spiritual in your life then. So spirituality in a man is his, is his availability to God so God can use him doing his divine work. So the, work, the form of the work is irrelevant. It's the availability that that person gives themselves to God so that God then can use them to do his work. That's what it is. So it's a desire for personal holiness. It's also a desire for God's approval. You're wanting God's approval on your life. Now I think all of us here ought to want to have that. In Matthew 25, 23, the Bible says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's one day. He said, one day you're going to hear that. He's going to say, uh, you're going to have the examination there. He's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. So he's saying there that, that one day you're going to hear, well done, possibly. Every Christian is going to face God one day. And every Christian will want at that day to hear those words. You may not now, but one day you will want to hear those words. The only problem is few people are willing to live out that desire on a daily basis. That's the problem. It's got to be done on a daily basis. We will do good one day and not the next. 
We'll allow our friends to one day to get us into trouble and then we'll not the next. We're not consistent. We have to learn to be consistent. God's approval at the end of our lives can only be found if we're willing to seek that same approval on a daily basis. Every day we have to yield ourselves to God. Every day we have to avoid the sinful pleasures. Every day we got to have that goal in front of us uh, to keep ourselves on the right road. God's approval at the end of our lives can only be found if we're willing to seek it on a daily basis. There cannot be a well done unless there is a good and faithful. If there's not a good and faithful, there's not going to be a well done heard. One of the quickest ways for the flesh to get riled up, listen, one of the quickest ways for the flesh to get riled up is to refuse to give it what it wants. And it doesn't have to be done by somebody else. If your flesh wants food, it will pretend it's starving. It will make you think you're going to die. Isn't that what Esau did? He wasn't about to die. But that's what he said. But your flesh will pretend it's starving. I must have this food now. You don't believe me? Go on a diet tonight. Saying the word diet just makes your flesh. Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. And as soon as you walk by that, that little counter where it's got those little nuts right there or, or some candies right there, or you walk by an office of somebody and you see their little candy, di- the flesh says, you want one of them, don't you? And you're thinking, I sure do. You deny the flesh what it wants and it gets angry. The flesh wants certain things and and it will become consumed with it. It will become loud and stubborn because you deny the flesh what it wants and it will get riled up because it wants it now. There was a sign, well, when we went to Mexico there was one, but uh, we all do it. Whenever you see the sign, wet paint, do not touch. How many of you have touched it? Oh, come on. Three, four? Come on. You know, you, some of you just lied here. You better hit the altar tonight. <laughs> you know what we got to do? The flesh hates people telling it what to do. We hate it. And even a sign, wet paint, do not touch. Is it still wet? And now we've marred it a little bit if it's still wet. If it's not, then we're lucky. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter. Some of you are thinking, there's no way I could do this. There's no way I could live this, this life on a daily basis every single day. We're not going to be perfect. I understand that. But you can do it every day. There's some people in our school, they won't get 10 demerits all year long. Some people can't go 10 days without getting 10 demerits. It's all in the desire. It's all in the desire. Let me show you where your strength can come from. 1 Peter chapter number 1, look at verse number 3. 3 and 4. The Bible says, 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Yes, I got it. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I think I wrote down the wrong verse. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I read three and four? According to his abundant mercy, I've forgotten us in the lively hope of resurrection. I can't, oh my goodness, I wrote down a, the wrong verse. Uh, I wish I could think of it real quickly here because that is one word I wanted you to see. It, talk, it talks about, it may be 2 Peter uh, 1, 3, and 4, I'm not sure, but it, it's, it's, it talks about whether we might be partakers of the, uh, let me check 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Yes, it is, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now it's making sense, all right, I apologize. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, according to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, we like to think he gave us everything we needed to to be saved, and yes, that's true. But he also gave us everything we needed to pertain unto life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, the promises, ye might be, notice the word partakers, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That word partakers, it means associates. It's a word that means partners, uh, sharers, I guess you could be. The words might become uh, means may become. So in other words, God has given you everything you need. He's made you a partner. He's made you a sharer, an associate, that you may become, it says here, uh, uh, the escape, the, become godly is what he's talking about. The divine nature is what he wants you to have there. We would normally understand or think that this is coming from the salvation, that it took place and, and now we're saved. And he's also saying it pertains to godliness. So in other words, something happened here in the verb that he's using, something happened, an event happened in this person's life or in everyone's life that makes it possible for them not to sin if they choose not to and become godly if they choose to. And that happened at the moment of salvation. When the Holy Spirit came to live inside your body, the moment you got saved, you were immediately transformed. You're no longer the same. That's why the Bible says we are new, a new creation in one verse, and it says a new creature in another verse. Let me ask you this. How does a caterpillar know to fly when it becomes a butterfly? It would never flown before. It crawled around everywhere it went. But it goes into that cocoon and it's transformed and it automatically knows to fly. Well, the same thing with us. As it became a new creature that, can, that is transformed and can do something different that it couldn't do before. The Bible says we're transformed. We're new creatures. We're new creations. And when we got saved, he put the Holy Spirit inside of us and we're a new creation now. We're transformed now. And we now have inside of us a longing for godliness. But you've got to feed it. If you don't feed it, it's going to die out. When a person gets out of prison, he just walks out. You don't have to drive him out. He wants out. He walks out when he gets out of prison. You have been given a brand new nature. You have the ability inside you because you've been transformed. You're a new creation. That's how the caterpillar knows how to fly. You've been transformed. You have the ability as a new creature, as a new creation, to have the ability to have the divine nature that God has. That's godliness. You have the ability to live a life of holiness. Because of that transformation. Have you ever noticed, and I'm sure you have as you're reading the Bible, how God changes names of people? Abram was changed to Abraham. Uh, Jacob was changed to Israel. Why the name change when it's the same person? Why would God do that? He's trying to show here that even though physically they're the same person, spiritually they're not. Spiritually, he, he's highlighting that, that transformation in that individual. He's now one of his people. And that's why we're called Christian. We're now one of his people. We've been transformed. We have the divine nature inside of us, the Holy Spirit. You have the ability inside you to live the Christian life. The only difference is you've got to want it. If you want to live a godly life, you can live a godly life. You just don't want it bad enough. Now, it doesn't mean sinless perfection. We still got our fallen nature inside of us. We're not going to be perfect 100% of the time. But I think any person can choose to sin or choose not to sin any time he wants to. He's not going to do it 100% of the time because we're flesh. But he can say, I'm not going to do that and walk away. It's like a blueberry pie. Blueberry pies was one of my favorite pies. I got so many of them now, but I, had, I used to buy me some of these. You get them at Walmart, little 50-cent blueberry pies. Oh, I'd buy 25, 30 of them, stack them up in the fridge. You know, I was that. 
But if you don't eat them by the date on them, oh, they taste nasty, you know. So, but anyway, they're not the best pies that some of you ladies can make now, I'm, I'm, and men. But if I set one of those blueberry pies down, every, they're in the fridge. They were stacked up. I don't have any now. I'd go to the door and get me a soda out of there, one of those sodas with not a lot of calories or whatever, you know. And I'd see them. They're staring at me. Like, oh, man, no, not going to have one. And I might do that one time. I might do that two times. I might even do that three or four times. But eventually, I'm going to grab one of those blueberry pies. And I'm going to eat it. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be 100%. But you can choose to be godly if you want to. You say, well, I just can't give this up. Yes, you can. If you can't, you're not saved. You're transformed. You're a brand new creature, a brand new creation. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you that can give you the power and the promises to live the godly life. You just got to want it. Our Father, we ask your blessings on the invitation tonight, and I pray that each one of us will have the desire or get the desire. Even more so, may it always grow deep within us to be like you, to be near you, because the more we love you, the more we want your presence in our life, the more we want to be near you, and the more we'll act like you. And we'll be becoming imitators. That's what the Bible even teaches. But the difference is we're sincere. We're not trying to act a part. We're not trying to be a hypocrite. But we want it. And so tonight, help us to want it even more. I can't, I can't put that want inside someone. They have to want it themselves. But Lord, help us to get a hold of the principles, get a hold of the truth that the Holy Spirit inside of us can help us live the godly life because we're new creatures. We can live differently now. We're no longer a slave to sin. And so help us to want, want that in our lives, please, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together as the piano and organ plays a couple of verses. Brother Goldchild, would you close this in prayer?